Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be started in about less than 30 seconds. Um, <clears throat> I want to let you know that uh, this coming Friday, I am expecting to have surgery on my left shoulder. I am uh, having issues for about a year now with my rotator cuff. And I'm going to have to do something to get some things repaired so that I can move my left arm a little. Well, let's get started. Tonight we're talking about abiding and the enemy. In Matthew 5.11, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. As Christians, we must come to grips with the fact that we are at war, like it or not. We hear terms such as culture war and various wars on, such as a war on poverty, a war on women, a war on drugs, war on guns, and a war on Christmas. I would submit to you that though some of these people are, some of these are real, the majority are, are diversions from the real war. The Apostle Paul states, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6.12. Satan is a master magician and diversion or sleight of hand is a powerful trick in his arsenal. He creates a diversion to draw attention away from what he's really doing. The final two Beatitudes address persecution for righteous living for those who hold their testimony in Christ. It was just days after September 11th, 2001, when commentators, supposedly enlightened individuals, made statements that evangelical Christians were no different than the Taliban. And that accusation is still made. In Christian Amanpour's report, God's Warriors for CNN in 2007, she gave Muslim fundamentalists in the U.S. sympathetic treatment while showing concern for right-wing Jewish settlers in the West Bank and discomfort towards the theology and practices of American evangelical Christians. Amanpour even equated one Christian youth group with the Taliban. And that mentality continues today. Peter reminds us to not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes up upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. It's First Peter 4.12. Persecution is part of the normal Christian life. Now, granted, the American Christians have not faced anything like their brothers and sisters have in India, China, the Philippines, or Muslim countries. However, that is beginning to change. I recommend to you a book uh, by David Limbaugh, that is uh, Rush Limbaugh's brother. He's a lawyer in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and it, his book is called Persecution, which details persecution of Christians that has begun in the United States. Now, the book was written in 2004, and I am sure that considering the years since its original printing, that many more examples could be used. 
to update it. But I encourage you also to look at Voice of the Martyrs, which deals with persecution across the globe. Now, what does persecution look like in Scripture? Persecution for righteousness' sake began, unfortunately, with the first family. Cain murdered his brother in a jealous rage because his offering was not pleasing to God as Abel's was. Look at the message the Lord says, sends and speaks with Cain. He says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will, you, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you must master it. It's Genesis 4, 6 and 7. That is an interesting phrase, the very end there, but you must master it. That tells us that we have the ability to resist. Even the book of James says that you can uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. It's just too often that we're falling into the trap of Satan that, you know, if I could use a Star Trek analogy from years ago from the next generation and the board, that resistance is futile when it's not. So the war was on and is still on. The deceiver and his deception could not be overcome, but it would take, it would take effort. He, he could overcome it, but it would take his effort. But Cain was unfortunately unwilling. The sin that was crouching at the door had torn the door off its hinges. And Cain lured his brother into a field and murdered him. Now let's talk about the tactics of Satan. First is deception. Jesus states that Satan is a liar. He states in the phrase, same phrase that he's also a murderer. And that's the second tactic, murder. Jesus states that Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Doubt. Satan plants seeds of doubt that cause you to question God's word and his goodness. Discouragement. Satan causes you to look at your problems rather than God and worshiping him. And I can tell you that, you know, I have been seriously discouraged by the devil. He did a number on me for, for many, many years. His discouragement kept me from writing your spiritual house. Um, I started writing it. And I would hear voices in my head like, you know, who do you think you are to write? Nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody wants to hear from you. I heard those voices very often. And it was discouraging. It was also a lie. But it was a lie that I managed to allow myself to fall into. He caused me to doubt uh, that God instructed me to write. He gets people to focus on their own inadequacies. And quite frankly, we're all inadequate. But that's whom God chooses to use. And through his spirit, through his power, he causes our inadequacies to work. He changes the table. He changes the game, so to speak. And he uses us to accomplish his will. Satan also uses diversion. He's a master magician. He causes you to fail to see what's, what he's really doing. 
like a magician, you're looking at one hand when the real action is occurring in the other. He causes wrong things to seem attractive so that you want them more than what is right. Defeat. Satan causes you to feel like a failure, so you don't even try. He can plant thoughts into your mind. He is the accuser of the brethren. Delay. Satan causes you to, he tempts you. You fall in, we fall into it. Not just you out there, it's me. He causes us to put off doing something so that many times it's either never started or never completed. Like the book, it was delayed. I, I literally started writing that book. Now it was over 22 years ago. I had so much of an outline written, ready to go. And I had many pages written, but I just kept getting hammered. One, uh, one day after another, every time I would try to pick it up and start working. And finally, I just quit listening to his lies. And there's the failure to pray. Satan tempts God's children to believe they can handle some of the problems put before them. So let's look at deception. Satan is a deceiver. If Satan cannot silence the truth, he seeks to disguise it. This is seen in the book of Numbers when people began to complain about God's provision of food. God provided food daily in the form of manna. It's Exodus chapter 16, verse 35. People began to complain because they wanted meat. As a result of the complaints, God sends a plague upon the people. Oh, he gave them meat. He gave it until it was rotting in their mouths. Korah becomes another example where Satan seeks to disguise the truth by claiming that he was claiming that Moses is not the only one whom God is speaking through. The result, Korah and those who followed him were judged by God. And that judgment was final. The Gibeonites, they're a great example of disguising the truth. They disguised the truth in Joshua 9. They had heard what Israel had accomplished by the help of God when it came to Jericho and Ai. They disguised themselves using worn out travel gear, clothes, shoes, stale bread. And they met Israel at Gilgal and asked for a covenant of peace. And this leads to another trick of Satan. Satan convinces some of us that some issues we can handle on our own. The deception of the Gibeonites led Israel to sin against God. Joshua failed to inquire of the Lord prior to making a covenant with them, and the Gibeonites became an entanglement to Israel. Satan is a discourager. Can you imagine the ridicule that Noah experienced? Because he began building a boat that God told him to do for 120 years. And he preached, saying that God would bring rain upon the earth. And all the people of the day, outside of his family, thought he was crazy. They refused to listen until it was too late and the door was shut. And the question might be asked if they even understood what rain was, since it may have, they may have never seen it. But the fact of the matter is, Noah proclaimed God's truth, and they chose not to accept it. God does what it appears into human eyes to be impossible. God does God-sized acts that only God can do, lest anyone else attempt to take credit for it. Now, how big are your giants? One of Satan's tactics is to present himself, the problem, as greater than reality. 
Moses led people to the doorway of the promised land. Yet many who came out of Egypt in the Exodus, who saw God's mighty acts done on their behalf, said, there's giants in the land. We can't take possession of it. Israel failed at Kadesh Barnea, which is Numbers chapter 14. And everyone, 20 years and older, would die in the wilderness wandering for the next 38 years, except for two men, Joshua and Caleb, who said, we can do it. We can take this land that God has promised us. Goliath was some nine feet tall. The Bible tells us that King Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else of the men of Israel. Saul had armor, but physically no one in Israel could match up against Goliath. And Goliath issued a challenge that if anyone of Israel could uh, kill him, then the Philistines would be Israel's servants. But if it was the other way around, that if Goliath killed a man of Israel, then Israel would be their servants. And when Saul and all of Israel, all the, the army heard those words, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. except one kid. David was a kid. He was probably, I don't think he was 18 years old then. He was tending the flock. And his father asked him to go and take provisions for his brothers who were in the army and report back to him how it was going. And when and David was there when he heard Goliath. And he said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should mock the armies of the living God? David was not impressed or intimidated by Goliath's size. He said in 1 Samuel 17 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hands of of this Philistine. David was given Saul's armor, but he, he took it off. He couldn't wear it. He was not used to it. He wouldn't use it. He said, this day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. He said this to Goliath, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. That's 1 Samuel 17, 46. And David, with the help of the Lord, killed Goliath. And thus began the defeat of the Philistine army. Satan is also a murderer. He's a murderer of people. He is a murderer of truth. Satan is a murderer of people, and Satan seeks to silence the truth. Pharaoh sought to have all the male children of Israel murdered in Egypt for fear that Israel's population would outnumber Egypt's and take it over. Later, Pharaoh's magicians imitated the early plagues in an attempt to discredit Moses. Pharaoh doubles the labor output of the slaves to discredit and discourage Moses. And after Pharaoh releases Israel, his army is commanded to hunt them down. And God destroys them in the Red Sea. Now Balaam was hired to curse Israel in their wanderings. But God turned the curses into a blessing. Saul sought to kill David because he knew that God rejected him as king and he would replace him with David. And David, because of his own sin with Bathsheba, 
succeeded in having her husband Uriah killed in battle. Jezebel was against Elijah and sought to hunt him down. Pasher had Jeremiah beaten and placed in stocks because of his message. See, all in Jeremiah's day, the prophets, the false prophets of Jeremiah's day were preaching peace. And Jeremiah was preaching, no, you're going to go into captivity in Babylon, submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And they wouldn't. Satan sought to discredit and kill the truth that Jeremiah proclaimed, namely that Babylon was coming to take Israel into captivity because of the nation's sin. Jeremiah was later thrown into an old well to die, but he was rescued. The king Jeho Jehoiakim, here's an example of how Satan tries to kill the truth. He took the scroll that Jeremiah had read, had, had written and, and was, had been read to him. And at the conclusion of each page, he tore it off, had it torn off, and thrown into the fire. So our copy of Jeremiah is a second copy of what was written. Jeremiah had to rewrite it while he was in prison through his scribe, Baruch. The wise men of King Darius's court sought to have Daniel killed in the lion's den. They didn't like the truth that Daniel proclaimed. They didn't like that he worshipped his God. They didn't like that King Darius listened to him more than them. And back to Elijah. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel ruled in Israel. Their reign was founded upon idolatry and intimidation. And Jezebel set out to exterminate all the prophets of the Lord. Elijah believed that he was the last one of God's prophets. And at Mount Carmel was a clash of the titans. Elijah on one side and the 450 prophets of Baal on the other. Those were Jezebel's uh, prophets. Elijah taunts Baal's prophets, accusing Baal of being in the bathroom, sitting on the toilet. He even had water poured on his sacrifice. He had a trench dug around it and water poured in. and prayed that God would answer his prayer and turn the hearts of the people back to God. Fire fell from the sky and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and the water that was in the trench. That's 1 Kings 18.32. The response of the people was to fall on their faces and confess the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah had all the prophets of Baal killed at Mount Carmel, all 450 of them, which sent Jezebel into a rage, promising to kill Elijah within the next day. That's when he runs to Mount Sinai and is encountered by God. Let's go to the New Testament. King Herod killed all the children two years and old and younger in Bethlehem afraid of a king being born. Years later, a different Herod killed John the Baptist, had him beheaded because he didn't like, especially his wife did not like, the preaching of John the Baptist that Herod was committing adultery with his brother Philip's wife because that's who he had taken as a wife, took his own brother's wife. Strange stuff. This uh, <clears throat> same Herod uh, had, had the Apostle James beheaded. He would have had Peter killed also, but God intervened. The religious leadership of the day couldn't bear the truth to hear the indictment of Stephen against them, and they stoned him to death. 
And Paul was hounded by the religious leadership of his day, arrested, beaten, tried, and finally executed in Rome. John was exiled to Patmos. All of these instances, Satan was instrumental in killing the person or seeking to silence the truth. There's a line in a movie called A Few Good Men, where a character, Colonel Nathan R. Jessup, who's played by Jack Nicholson, is questioned by Lieutenant Daniel Caffey, played by Tom Cruise. Caffey demands the truth. I want the truth. And Jessup replies, you can't handle the truth. It is Satan who can't handle the truth. Satan will bend it like a pretzel, and the naive will fall into his trap. Others just choose to disobey God's direct instructions. That was the case of Achan in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. God strictly stipulated that the sons of Israel were to not take anything from the wreckage of Jericho. It all belonged to God. It was under a ban. And Achan fell into temptation by the evil one. When confronted with the truth, Achan said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle of Shinar, 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, and I coveted them. I took them and they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. That's Joshua 7, 20 through 21. <clears throat> Satan's trick is to convince God's people that an issue is no big deal. And that's what he did with Achan. He caused him to lust. Oh, it's not a big deal. This is not that much. It's also seen in the failure to pray, making a rash vow. An example of this is seen in the life of Abraham, Sarah. Abraham was told by God that he would have a son, yet it didn't happen in the time frame or in the manner that Abraham or Sarah thought it should. Sarah's solution, give her servant Hagar to bear children. Abraham failed to seek God in this case. Later, when Sarah expelled Hagar and her son Ishmael, Abraham then went to God and prayed, and God told him, listen to the voice of your wife, because Ishmael was not the child of promise. That's Genesis 15, uh, 16, and verse 21. Joshua failed to pray. After their great victory at Jericho, they went on. The next city was Ai. Joshua sent individuals to spy out Ai. Spies returned and told Joshua, don't let all the people go up. Only two or three thousand men need to go. Do not make all the people toil up there for they are few. So about 3,000 men went, and they fled from the men of Ai, Joshua 7.3. 36 men died in that battle. And then Joshua fell before the Lord and prayed, and God responded to his prayer. Sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things that are under the ban from your midst. There is sin in the camp. That's Joshua 7, 12. That's when Achan and his family were found out to be guilty, and they were stoned to death. Judges 11 is the story of Jephthah the ninth judge of Israel, and he made a rash vow before God. He said, if, if you will give 
me the sons of Amnon into my hand. You give me victory in this battle. Then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Amnon, it shall be the Lord's, and I'll offer it as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. It's Judges 11, 30 to 31. Who comes out but his precious and one and only daughter? We say a lot of stupid things. We make rash vows. We don't think some things are a very big deal to God. Abraham, Joshua, Jephthah, you and I, we, have, we didn't have to go through some of the heartbreak that we've experienced, that they've experienced, if we'd only inquired of the Lord. They chose to act in these instances in self-sufficient manner rather than being dependent on God. And in these instances, these heroes of the faith didn't abide in their relationship with the Lord. And it resulted in disaster. And in one case, we're still feeling the consequences of that disaster 4,000 years later, summed up in one word, Islam. Folks, I hope that you will think of the ways in which Satan is a deceiver, that he's a murderer of people, of truth. He's a liar. He causes doubt. He seeks to discourage you. He plants diversions, get you to look one way when it's actually the other causes you to think about defeat or delay or the failure to pray. I hope you'll go back and look over this again and just think about what are the ways that Satan gets you where you fall into his trap. We all have weaknesses every one of us and satan knows you better than you know yourself so i challenge you to look back over the ways in which satan works and come to an understanding of how does he work in your life remember those words that god said to cain Sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. It's not impossible. Resistance is not futile. Hopefully, uh, I will be back next Tuesday. As I said, I'll be having surgery on my left shoulder for a rotator cuff this coming Friday. Next week, I plan to talk about the second half of this lesson, which is abiding in the Lord versus the works of the flesh. I hope you have a good remainder of the week and that the Lord will bless and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. And good night. <laughs>